Hi everybody. Today we should be talking to Elena Munoz and Jose Eber from the Dravet Syndrome Foundation EU about, as you can probably guess, Dravet Syndrome. It's a rare genetic type of epilepsy. And we're going to be talking about the work that they put into finding an effective treatment for Dravet through scientific research and also how they educate both clinicians and families um, and people like you and I really um, from around the world. So here's a bold statement of theirs that I'm going to read out. That is, we want to find a drug within three years that eliminates the symptoms and allows us to preserve the cognitive state of our patients until we are able to find a definitive solution for the disease. Now that is a really big deal. So if you're interested in learning more, keep watching. And make sure you subscribe, press that bell down there for notifications uh, for future videos uh, regarding epilepsy. Jose, president of the foundation, please tell us a bit about yourself. <laughs> Hi, hi, hello, Tori. So, yeah, Jose, I'm national from Spain, but I can really live in, in Nice, in France. Uh, I got two kids. Uh, one of them has uh, Travet syndrome, and this is what led me to, to be involved or to get involved in the activities of the Travet syndrome foundation in Spain. How long have you been involved with it? I mean, personally, forever, but I mean, with the Travet Foundation in Spain? Uh, since 2016, so almost five years now, but then I joined the board of directors uh, in 2018, and that year I became the, the president of the organization as well. And Elena, tell us about yourself. Hello, I'm uh, Elena Cardenal, and I'm the scientific director of Travet Syndrome Foundation Spain. And I'm working at the foundation since uh, March 2020 just before COVID came. <laughs> uh, and before that, I was I was a scientist myself and also working for a, a scientific organization. And now I, I went to, to scientific management with the foundation. What got you into Drave? Because science is, they just cover everything. So why Drave syndrome? I had a, a, a talk with uh, Jose and also another uh, trustee of the foundation. And they were telling me about the disease of their kids. I, I learned more about the, the disease itself and all the problems that the, it costs to the, to the patients and also to the families. And I thought uh, I wanted to translate the, what I've learned during my years as a scientist, uh, I wanted to translate that into supporting uh, real patients, real people, and and yeah, and joining efforts to to help them advance in the in the improvement of the disease. Yeah, improvement of people's lives, right? Improvement of the the patients' lives and their carers and everything. So, um, can you tell us a bit about Dravet syndrome? What does it involve? Like what? is it how does it compare to other forms of epilepsy because i know it's not only in epilepsy it's got other stuff in it <laughs> yeah so the dravet syndrome is a rare disease it's a rare epilepsy uh, and also very complex it's caused by in more than 80 percent of patients by a mutation in a gene scn1a uh, that encodes for for a sodium channel so it uh, it dysregulates this mutation the the good functioning of the brain so so uh, seizure so there are seizures producing so normal uh, transmission of electric signals cannot occur properly and, and this uh, appears so the first symptom is a seizure that appears when the kid uh, the baby is around six months of age uh, and after that there are many different types of seizures occurring very long very prolonged uh, drug resistant and further the disease developing in problems in cognition problems language motor behavior so many many different comorbidities that affect the patient and is it um, a de novo mutation or is it inherited? Do you know, or could it be both? Yeah, it can be both, but most of patients have a de novo mutation. In some cases, uh, parents of a family member of the of the family can also have the mutation but it might not affect them uh, in the same severe uh, severity because uh, there are other factors or the mutations in different genes um, uh, environmental factors etc that can um, that can make these these changes in phenotype because i think so a common misunderstanding amongst many people is that if you have one gene that looks a bit shifty and has a mutation, then that is the only gene responsible for each disease. And, and, the, and also there's this common misconception that 
if you have a certain gene mutation, you will have, you will experience a disease in exactly the same way as another person. But all of that, all of what I just said is completely wrong, right? Yeah, I say indeed. So there are uh, where all DRAVET patients, most of DRAVET patients have this mutation in SCN1A, but the, the mutation can be very different. So in different uh, p uh, nucleotides in the gene or a different type of mutation. So there might be patients with a mutation in another gene apart from SCN1A or a DRAVET patient with a clinical diagnosis of DRAVET, but the, who does not have a mutation in SCN1A. It has a mutation in other genes that have uh, or produce similar phenotypes and at the end the clinical future is, is very similar, so they are diagnosed as DRAVET. So it's very complex. Do you ever have, or do, we, do families and individuals ever experience a misdiagnosis of DRAVET or the other way around? So sometimes they might be told you have DRAVET syndrome, but actually it ends up being lennox gastel syndrome or something like that, or I don't know, does that happen? Yeah, yeah, in, the, in, in, in fact, yeah, that's very common, you know, uh, DRAVET syndrome occurs only in one out of uh, 16,000 births and therefore it's considered a red disease, no? And like uh, many other red disease, there is a, a, a very long odyssey to, to, to get the diagnosis and during that way, during that, that pre uh, process, uh, yeah, many, many patients uh, get a misdiagnosis. Uh, um, you know, we are in our foundation, we are running a whole genome sequencing program where we are providing um, the, the, the sequencing to those uh, patients with no uh, genetic diagnosis and every day we find patients with a mutation other than a SIN1 aging, therefore with a, with a different entity, right? So yeah, it's, it's very, very common. Unfortunately, the patients and families may receive a different, a, a different diagnosis. Is it possible that because Dravet syndrome is not um, often knocked down to the mutation of just one gene that you could get whole genome sequencing and have and and then uh, a genesist would uh, analyze uh, analyze oh my goodness I can't talk analyze uh, the report and say that actually okay I think you have Dravet syndrome but still in that case perhaps you don't or you might have another disease alongside that but it is not noticed can that happen as well because I think it, diagnosis is not easy right yeah, yeah, that can happen indeed, no? Uh, as, uh, as Elena mentioned, no? Uh, a patient may have the clinical picture of Dravet syndrome, but if they have a, another specific uh, gene mutation, uh, then it might be another entity, it might be another disease, no? This may happen with CD, CDKL5, XD, SDX, BP1, and so on, right? At the end, they are, they are other, di uh, other uh, entities, other diseases, but the uh, phenotype might be similar to Dravet syndrome. So that's why it's also important to get to, to the genetic diagnosis as well. And as a dad, Jose, could you tell us how having a child that you love with Dravet syndrome, how does it affect a family? So it changed your life. It changed your life. Actually, all you, you think about it's changing. Uh, you cannot leave, uh, you cannot make plans. You have to live day by day. Uh, see how Dravet uh, <laughs> syndrome will uh, behave every single day. And then based on that, you, you make uh, you make your life, right? Uh, but anyway, uh, indeed, yeah, it's totally change, uh, changes your life. Your life. Because I often make comparisons, um, which annoy some people, but I don't care. Um, comparisons between someone like myself with um, an epilepsy, which is rare because it's refractory, but I don't have like com like a million seizures a day, for instance, and I don't have um, the comorbidities that many people with Dravet have and the behavioral issues that many people with Dravet have. I and mean, I could go on and on and on, but there are many similarities um, between us lot with a more common epilepsy and I do feel that that is often not acknowledged um, and I really empathize with you the, to the degree that I can and with your son because when you have a seizure unless you've had one it's really hard to understand um, and it's really hard to understand like post-ictal feelings um, pre-ictal um, you know common psychiatric issues all of these things I think it can be really hard for somebody outside of the scene to kind of have a feeling um, on how it feels for the individual. So do you think, like I do, that by coming together, whether your epilepsy is rare or not, we could achieve more than many organizations do? 
indeed no working together we are stronger we are not only more we are we are stronger as well and and that unity no we should we should encourage uh, for for people for organizations uh, to to work together towards a better future for people with epilepsy and their mums and dads carers and there is that ripple effect i think through the whole of society um, I know a mum whose um, daughter has a rare epilepsy and she, honestly she's not quite sure which one it is because of this whole um, diagnosis or odyssey like it, and she's in her 20s now she doesn't really know but she's also herself clinically depressed like these seizures are completely out of control she doesn't know where to go what to do she feels so alone she's the primary carer for her daughter and she doesn't really get the help that she needs and so well, there's two points here, I guess. I think that carers need support, um, but also it's worth acknowledging um, and taking, thinking about what action can be taken by governments to realise and look after the carers, the mums and dads, and even the siblings and stuff as well. Because once you've done that, there's going to be a positive ripple effect on society, not just for the patient it, themselves, you know? Yeah, totally, totally agree with you. you know, uh, rare disease like Dravet syndrome is, is impacting the whole family, not only the patient who, who has the disease, but the whole family. Parents, as you said, but also siblings. You also mentioned siblings. No? Uh, they are very commonly forgotten. And yeah, it's very important to take uh, to take them all into account and, and make, uh, yeah, uh, put the, the proper actions in place to, yeah, to, to get the most of them. So I, I, I would like to say that along with these uh, lines, it is very important for uh, physicians when, when they have the patients in, in the consultation that they tell them no or let them know, sorry, about patient organizations so that they find that support super important at the very at the very beginning, but during the long term of the disease, that they find themselves understood. Uh, and and the, also the many tools that organizations can provide them with. Because actually we are filling many 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 gaps. The public administration are unable to do to do. So that's why it's also important no, to take into account uh, patient organizations. Totally, and we're very lucky that you guys are multilingual. Again, I feel <laughs> embarrassed. Um, but you guys have connections with countries from all over the world, don't you? T tell us which countries it is. That you work with all all of them <laughs> well we are working internationally uh, it's true our our mother tongue is spanish but uh, we also we can also speak other languages i also speak french or or i try to speak english as well <laughs> elena Ele, elena elena as well and yeah we are working to with many many uh, countries or with experts and people in in many different countries we are lucky that english is the common language for most of us so that we can communicate yeah i'm more even even luckier aren't i i know um, <laughs> also a great thing i think about what you're doing and this international aspect is as much as we moan in the countries that we're in here um uh, that we're in today at least there is more support than there is in some lower to middle income countries and i think a great thing about technology today is that well we're we've never even met face to face have we and it's the no, same never, with, never, never. yeah it's amazing and um gosh i don't sound elderly saying that but anyway it's great that we can reach out to other individuals and families and organizations that used to be i think rarely even acknowledged do not have access to up-to-date research and treatment and care and you guys provide that right yeah, indeed. You, you, you know, we are we are very frequently in touch with uh, families from South America, and, and I always say, you know, we are very very lucky of uh, the access to treatment and care we have in Europe. If if you go to some countries in South America, or even if you go to some countries in Africa, it's terrible. It's terrible. It's terrible. So somehow, indeed, eh, we are we are very lucky of uh, the access to treatment and care we have in we have in Europe. Could you tell us about the mortality rate of people affected by Dravet, Dravet syndrome um, and SUDEP in those people? Yeah, so around 15, 20% of patients that die prematurely because of, uh, of the Dravet syndrome and half of them because of the SUDEP. So this is a high risk and that is not always uh, talked 
to pay to families because it is a difficult topic to, to talk about. Um, but yeah, there is also specific research going on on that. First learning uh, why this happens and, and then uh, how it can be treated. So we also make efforts on that. And uh, uh, yeah, we have in our scientific committee, we have an, an expert on, on SUDEP researcher and with him and with others, we, we, we try to, le to learn more about, about that. But yeah, this is a, an important uh, topic. Uh, there are rabbit adults. We cannot forget them and we need to uh, help all the others to, to arrive to the adulthood as well. We also need physicians to, to share openly you know, that risk with families. No? I have the feel that in, in I have the feel that in other fields like oncology, if you get a cancer diagnosis, you know that you may pass away and this is openly shared by your physician. That's not the case in Dravet syndrome. Uh, when the family get the diagnosis of Dravet syndrome, they don't get from the physician that maybe their their child may pass may, may pass away, no, may may die, and I think that's important, no, for physician to share this openly with families so they are aware of uh, of the risk. I completely agree, and you know what? It's obviously it's more well. It more prominent in Dravet syndrome and other types of rare epilepsies often, but even in the more common epilepsies, like they often don't talk about SUDEP. They just don't. And, uh, you know, it's a really good comparison comparing it to the cancers. People are aware cancer can be deadly, but why not talk about it with the epilepsies? And nobody told me about SUDEP until I was 32. And I've had, I was diagnosed when I was 10. And I think it's absolutely ridiculous. So I can say from a patient perspective as well, even though I've as I said, I don't have to evade. I would rather have been told out of respect as well. And it wasn't until then that I really started taking it properly seriously. The epilepsy, ah, I might actually die. Okay, how can I minimize those risks? And also um, for governments, actually, if you've got a higher mortality rate amongst a certain group of people, let's invest in research into how we can help those people or how lower their risk of sudden unexpected death and epilepsy i was talking this last weekend with a with a friend she 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 knows a mother who decided not to give uh, uh, treatment to the kid um, and then after years of uh, seizures and seeing that it was develop developing in something worse uh, she said okay i will try with some drugs some therapy but, and, and probably because she did not know that all the, the effects or all the problems that that could ha uh, handle so it's not only stopping seizures you can also improve many many treatments they improve that uh, percentage or that probability of of SUDEP right so um, it is important to talk about it and to to, to say what are the options to to de diminish that risk we teach people to cross the road, right? If, if the children are able, we say, look both ways, listen for any traffic and cross the road, but you still might get hit by a car, but you minimize your risk. And it can be very similar with the epilepsies. Okay, minimize your risk by taking the drugs that we know that are best for you at the moment that we've got, you know, um, try and make lifestyle adjustments if you can. I know it's different with Dravet often, but, um, and at least you've, then you've done your best to minimize the child's risk of SUDEP. How do you keep going? What is what are things like day to day? Well, as I said earlier, we have to to live day by day, right? We we cannot look into the future, or we cannot uh, plan for for. Uh, so so actually, yes, we have to to live day by day. Uh, obviously, with the support of my wife and Gabriel, I am able no to 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 be the head of the foundation and run uh, and well have my professional career as well. But yeah, day by day, day by day, you know, many, many uh, medical appointments, uh, seizures at any time, uh, hospitalization. So it's hard living with Dravet syndrome, but actually we have to live by, day by day. We, we cannot plan for tomorrow after tomorrow. Just live the day, enjoy the day and make the most of it. So you think it's acceptance of that sometimes, which can be really important for families rather Indeed, than... Yeah. <sighs> I don't know, like it's the word, the word cure is thrown around a lot um, and an expectation that things are going to be sorted tomorrow or next year. Um, I think managing expectations is really important. And once you come to, you acknowledge that things aren't going to change tomorrow, it can actually be simpler to deal with. Mm, it depends, really depends on the person. So some 
for some people having the hope even if the if they know it will not be immediate so uh, gene therapies coming will take time and also it might not be um, it might not be really curative for all patients it might depend on the on the mutation on the age of the patient on the uh, developmental stage of the patient etc but they they with that hope they they survive better others they prefer not to really know much about the disease so they are tired they are uh, and 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 they have fear so they prefer to 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 stay a bit uh, far from the from the old information and then just stay with the with the patient and and, and leave as it, it comes um, so it it really depends but you know, in the end, we are not running uh, a speed uh, speed uh, race. We are running a marathon, right? And we have to go meter by meter until we reach out to to the to the goal. And the goal, for sure, is uh, having better treatments for people with Dravet syndrome and related epilepsies. Can you tell us something positive that you've achieved as an organisation and the, and through the research that you do? Just give us some positive things that have happened over the past couple of years. There are many, many positive things. You know, for Dravet syndrome, the, there are now two new treatments on, on the market or approved for Dravet syndrome, like uh, fenfuramine and, and cannabidiol. And, and then uh, gene therapy or advanced therapies are, are there, right? And they are progressing very, very, very fast. In, and actually in Spain, uh, two centers uh, will participate in the in the studies of encoding therapeutics who have a one-time gene therapy to fix the, the underlying cause of uh, Dravet syndrome. So, wow. yeah, we are, yeah, we have many, we have our hopes on, on that uh, way of treatment, no? advanced therapy that have the potential to fix the underlying cause of the disease and therefore improve in many ways. That's so, so lovely. And so what part, though, do you as an organization play in things like that? For instance, for this uh, trial that uh, Jose mentioned, so the first step will be to do an, a natural history study. And for that, we managed to bring that study and the afterwards clinical trial to Spain. So uh, the company at the beginning was also in, was only intending to, to do the trial in in US and uh, other countries, Australia, UK, it's, and so on and we we are calling uh, knocking doors every day um, asking for bringing those trials so to, to Europe and to, to Spain so that our patients can have access to them as well uh, for the drugs that are already approved in Europe um, fenfluramine cannabidiol we have supported so we have uh, knocked uh, different doors in this case uh, to regulators to support and to to give information on how these uh, these drugs uh, can can really help uh, coping with the disease how good or uh, yeah no, how good or mm, the real effects that they have in our families so we provide that information we support the the fast approval and marketing access of of the those drugs so these are kind of things that we that we can do as an organization but what what i always say uh, tori is that we focus on our fo our efforts on two main pillars connecting people connecting patients with researchers professional physicians and so on so they can work together they can make the most of it and there's the risk in the field of a uh, drive syndrome research making sure uh, researching on drive syndrome it's uh, every day easier and easier so for that we we have uh, put in place uh, mouse models and different scientific tools so so we typically focus our effort on those two actions no connecting people and the risking the risk in the field do you know what? If I was a, a family affected by the Drave, I would just so love to hear what you just said as being your two main pillars, because it's providing that emotional support, knowing that you're not alone and the, the issues that you're going through, um, you're not the only one going through them. And that there is, that you have people like yourselves invested in, in the research, because without the research, we're kind of stuck like in the present, right? Things will never change. Can I ask how you get funding for your research, if you're allowed to answer that question? Or how would you like to get funding for that research? 
most of the funding we we have to support uh, research comes from families in fact and from from private support so we organized events now with covid we yeah bad luck we could not organize so so many events but even online events so like marathons running uh, sport uh, concerts uh, games for kids etc uh, uh, with those events we 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 get some some uh, funding uh, also private donations and and then we we apply as well uh, with uh, researchers clinicians we apply for for uh, public funding so we for instance we got some European funding for for next year and um, and and then also some private funding uh, private private sponsoring for some of our programs and projects for family support as well but but then it is true no COVID-19 is uh, really hitting hitting uh, a lot no to to non-profit organizations no o on one side on one side you know personal donations or micro donations are re decreasing a lot because of COVID and the financial uh, crisis uh, we have in front of us uh, many people are being laid off uh, losing their job and therefore stopping donations and the same happened with uh, corporate donations no? uh, number of uh, uh, the companies or enterprises that we are donating to us now they are no longer operating or they are just uh, firing out people so yeah how come they are going to give us money if they are firing out people it's rather frustrating because the funding doesn't disappear from the global economy it's there somewhere isn't it it's yeah, just indeed. distributed <laughs> differently ah, so if people want to help you if they want to find out more information about your work what do they do where do they go so our website www.drabetfoundation.eu or otherwise they can find us on Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, Instagram and so on. We are Fundación Síndrome de Drabet in Spanish and that's the way they can reach out to us. And if they want to help you in any way though, I mean, I guess reach out to you first if people want to help you with the funding or contribute their own knowledge or like, because we have listeners from, you know, uh, like clinicians as well as scientists. What about those guys? Is it the same way to reach out to you? They can also reach out to us by, by mail at research at drabetfoundation.eu. Uh, and for sure, uh, any kind of help and support will be very much uh, welcome. Thank you so much for your time. It's been really, it's been lovely to hear honestly about your research and your science and how that's going to positively impact people imminently, but also in the, in the future, 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 if you know what I mean. I wanted to thank you, Tori, for the for your work on raising awareness on, in this case, Rabbit syndrome, but also all the other epilepsy types and, and, and symptoms. Uh, you are making important, important job here. And we thank you for giving us the opportunity to talk about it.